the Akron level. During the year of 1839, I was employed as a hand on the steamboat Rochester, plying between Buffalo and Chicago. The following year, I left this position, and in 1840, I purchased a canal boat from S.R. Hutchinson and Company. This firm owned the stone mill on the canal in Cleveland. My boat, which was called the Auburn, was engaged in conveying wheat and merchandise on the Ohio Canal. The boat was a good passenger packet with good cabins, and her former owners concluded to buy the boat back, which they did. They then employed me as captain to manage her. On one occasion, while I was running the boat after having loaded with merchandise, I was ordered to deliver the goods to Chillicothe. Leaving Cleveland about noon, we arrived at Niles, Ohio about 9 o'clock in the evening. At this place, we were hailed by some person saying that a passenger wanted to get aboard to go south. We came alongside the dock and landed. Pretty soon after some baggage came on board, and in a short time, the owner of the baggage, who was a female, appeared. My crew consisted of one white steersman, one colored steersman, two white drivers, one colored bowsman, and one colored female cook. When the lady arrived, I stood aboard of the stern deck and assisted her aboard. When she went down into the cabin and saw the colored cook, she was taken completely by surprise. The colored steersman just didn't happen to go down into the cabin after something. The lady was sitting on the locker, and when she saw the colored steersman, she went immediately to the other side of the boat. After the bowsman had gotten his line snugly curled, he went down into the cabin, and, he accosted, and she accosted him, saying that she would like to see the captain. Accordingly, I was called and went down to see what she wanted. The light shone in my face so that she could easily see my features. The lady, after seeing me, suddenly sprang to her feet and with great shortness of breath exclaimed, Well, I never. I made a bow and left her and ordered the cook to set her stateroom doors open and take off all the bedding from the middle berth and supply clean bedding from the locker so that she might see the bedding was changed. And I requested the cook to tell the surprised lady to take the middle berth. She refused to go to bed and sat up all night. We arrived at Lock 21 at Bath and Riverview Roads in Peninsula, Ohio, north end of Akron Locks, at midnight. At nearly every lock there was a house or grocery, and I instructed the crew to keep the blinds on the boat closed so that the lady should not know she was in a village. For seeing that she was afraid of colored people, I wanted to give her full opportunity of getting acquainted with them before she arrived at her home in Circleville. When we arrived at Lock 1 under the West Exchange Street Bridge in downtown Akron, a little, time, a little after daylight, that brought us on to the Wolf Creek level. On going into the Wolf Creek lock, seeing that the lock was ready, we ran the boat right into the lock, and the hands divided a part on, the, on one side of the boat and a part on the other side. I gave the driver the signal, and he opened the wicket, lowered the boat down, and the lady was prevented from getting off there if she had felt disposed to do so. Before we had got to this point, and while we were yet on the Wolf Creek level, I invited the lady to breakfast, which she refused, saying that she did not feel very well. When we arrived at the Fulton Lake, it brought us on to the Maslin level, and it being dinner time, I invited the lady to dinner. She still complained of not feeling very well, but took a piece of pie from where she stood. Then we arrived at, arrived at the Bethlehem level, and when tea was ready, I invited her to tea, and she took a cup of tea and a biscuit. Just about this time, we passed through a strip of woods about a mile in length. The moon was full, and it was a beautiful evening. The cook, having got through th with her cabin work, came on deck. While she was proceeding toward the deck, the lady passenger followed her in a hesitating manner. They promenaded the deck together for a while and then retired. That night, I suppose, the lady took a good night's sleep, for I did not hear anything from her until the next morning. When breakfast was ready and receiving an invitation, she readily took a seat at the table and ate a hearty meal, and from that time on, she felt reconciled to her surroundings and conversed freely with the cook and all on board. When we arrived at Circleville, she left us. I provided means for the conveyance of her baggage, and her leaving, she thanked me and said, Captain, when I first came on board, your boat, you, <laughs> Captain, when I first came aboard your boat, not being accustomed to travel in this way, I suppose I must have acted quite awkward. Now I must return my thanks to you and your crew for the kind treatment I have received. 
I never traveled so comfortably in my life, and I expect to go north soon, and I will defer my journey until you are going north, even if I'm obliged to wait two or three days. I never saw the lady again. Peskin, Allen, Editor, North into Freedom, The Autobiography of John Malvin, Free Negro, 1795-1880, to Cleveland. The Westwood Reserve Historical Society, 1996, John Malvin, uh, 1879. Autobiography of John Malvin, a narrative, Cleveland Leader Printing Company retrieved from William Katz L. 1199, Black Pioneers, an untold story, and all illustrations are from the author's collection.